thanks for coming, everybody. Um, this is our third uh, science talk here this academic year, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to um, the talk today. And uh, but just a quick plug, I, I was uh, mentioning something at the beginning of this, but if you're interested in giving a, a talk about anything science related, uh, you know, come talk to me. We definitely uh, would like to, you know, anybody interested in sharing their knowledge with our students and faculty and staff. Uh, uh, so just come talk to me, okay, if you have any interest in that. Um, my name's Tim. So, um, so uh, today uh, we have uh, uh, Nicole and how do you say her last name? I didn't even ask you. Vanderscaff. Vanderscaff. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So just kind of how it looks. So uh, <laughs> Nicole Vanderscaff. Uh, she's a fifth year student and a PhD candidate at the Van Andel Institute Graduate School, and she conducts her dissertation research in the lab of Dr. Peter Laird. Am I saying Laird correctly? Mm -hmm. Um, a world-renowned expert in cancer epigenetics and uh, where she aims to understand how epigenetic abnormalities arise and may predispose uh, individuals to colon cancer. In 2017, Nicole became the first student at uh, Van Andel uh, Graduate School to earn a highly competitive, I'm probably going to say this wrong, uh, F31 Ruth L. Kirchstein Predoctoral Research Award, right? Sounds great. Pretty close. <laughs> Uh, from the National Institute of Health, uh, which supports her current research in this area. Prior to graduate school, she earned a bachelor's in biology from Indiana Wesleyan University, uh, where she researched extremophilic bacteria from Antarctica. So um, please welcome uh, Nicole. Thank cool, thank you all for having me today and for sticking around to the end of the day. Um, so I work up the hill, so many of you probably drive past it every day, the Van Andel Research Institute. And one of our main focus areas there is epigenetics. We have some of the world's leaders in epigenetics. Seriously, if you go to a conference in Colorado and say that you work with so-and-so, Peter Laird or Peter Jones, the people who know epigenetics know those names. So it's pretty, a pretty cool honor to be a part of that community. So how many of you, just out of curiosity, before this talk, so like right now, feel like you have a pretty good grasp of what epigenetics is. Got a couple? Okay, we'll see. So I didn't know how much you would know. I know that coming out of undergrad, I didn't know very much epigenetics. Actually, I didn't really know what the word was. So I started from the ground up and we'll build and hopefully you'll learn something along the way. So the outline for my talk today, we're gonna to start with an intro to what is epigenetics, but first, the root of that word is genetics. So to make sure we're all on the same page, we're gonna start with genetics. Part two is gonna bring in what is cancer and how do genetics and epigenetics apply to cancer. And then part three, I'm gonna share two short stories um, related to research in this area, one that I've done and one that I wish I had done because it's really cool. And then I'll save time for your questions at the end. They can be about research, they can be about grad school, whatever you want to ask. Okay, so genetics. We think about uh, genetics as being the, the traits that you inherit from your mom and dad, maybe the brown hair, blue eyes. Um, so this is the study of heredity. And what carries that information is called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, shown here in this um, double helix. And so this is the code that instructs all of your cells on what to do. And it has an alphabet of four letters, A, T, C, and G. And um, this DNA, if you were to stretch it out, um, all the DNA from one cell, if you stretched it out, it would be about six and a half feet long, which is quite a lot of DNA. So this is a serious packaging job of getting that DNA into the nucleus of a cell, which, by the way, is uh, less than the width of a single piece of hair. So that's a lot going in the nucleus. So it's packaged into units called chromosomes, and you have 23 pairs of chromosomes in uh, each nucleus, so for each cell. So the first step in packaging this DNA is called the nucleosome, where the DNA, shown in orange, this double helix, is wrapped around some core histone proteins. And I've brought this 3D printed model of a nucleosome. For those of you who are visual, tangible learners, I'm going to pass this around. So it's kind of fragile, so just be careful. Um, 
But this is the first step for packaging your DNA. Um, but there are many more steps after that. Um, so after it's in the nucleosomes, then it gets coiled up into chromatin and then looped and looped some more into these chromosomes. So it's quite an intense packaging job to fit it all in there. And we're going to talk about how this packaging relates to um, accessibility of genes and to epigenetics. OK, so I said you have 23 chromosomes, uh, chromosome pairs in each of your cells. You got 23 of those from your mom and 23 from your dad to make these 46 chromosomes. And that zygote then give, gave rise to every cell type in your body. Um, so we've got bone cells, adipose, so that's fat, cartilage, epithelial cells. So all the cells in your body, even though there's many different types, they all have or should have the same DNA that you received from each parent. So then the question I propose is how then do these cells that are following the same genetic code, how are they so different? And the answer to that is obviously epigenetics, which is what we're going to talk about today. So what is epigenetics? Um, so this uh, is the study of what controls gene expression without changing the DNA sequence. So we're not changing the A, T, C, and G in the DNA, but yet we're able to control gene expression. And so I like, I'm going to use several analogies throughout this talk just to try to make things more simple and understandable. I like to think of um, epigenetics as a dimmer switch. So each segment of your DNA is called a gene if it encodes for a certain product. So let's say you have a gene for freckles that you inherited. Epigenetics can turn that gene on and say, yes, this person's going to have freckles. Or it can turn the gene off and say, nope, they're not actually going to get freckles. Or it can be intermediate and you have some freckles. So that's essentially how this works. But every cell type uh, in your body can have different expression levels of each gene. So that's why there are so many different cell types, is because even though they're following the same code, they're reading it differently uh, and at different levels in the different cells. OK, let's dig a little deeper into what is epigenetics. So epi means on top of. So epigenetics describes chemical modifications added to DNA or to the histones that package DNA. And these chemical modifications impact gene expression. So some of the examples of chemical modifications include methylation. We're going to talk more about this one. This is methylation directly onto DNA. Um, but also the histone proteins can get acetylated, methylated, phosphorylated, ubiquitinated. We're not going to talk about all of those. It gets quite complicated. But they also work together in synergy. We're going to focus on DNA methylation today. So what do these chemical tags do? What does, what does that end up doing? What it does is it uh, impacts the accessibility or the readability of your DNA. So imagine a piece of paper that has a recipe that you're trying to read. If you crumpled that piece of paper up, most people wouldn't be able to read the recipe. It's too tightly packaged. So we talked about the packaging issue of DNA before. The same thing happens uh, in your cells. If the DNA is too tightly packaged into what's called heterochromatin, it can't be read, and so those genes can't be made, or the recipe can't be made. But if the DNA is more loosely packaged um, in the euchromatin state, that can be read. And so these epigenetic tags instruct how tightly the DNA should be packaged, um, and then controls whether it can be read or not. So I said that DNA methylation is going to be our chemical modification of interest today. That's what my lab primarily studies. So this is uh, the addition of a methyl group, which is one carbon, three hydrogens, onto a cytosine, so the C of the DNA code. And this occurs in the context of a C followed by a G, a guanine. And here's the structure up here, CH3. So when DNA methylation is added to the DNA at the promoter region of a gene, so the part that regulates the expression of the gene. What happens, this is methylation is represented by these dark colored lollipops. What happens is that gene gets repressed. It's turned off. It's not transcribed. And as you can imagine, that has to do with how tightly packaged that DNA is, whether it can be read or not. 
So it helps convert DNA from the euchromatic state to heterochromatin, where it becomes more packaged and then can no longer be read. OK, so before I conclude part one, I just want to emphasize how important epigenetics is for your cells and DNA methylation. Because later in the talk, we're going to talk about how cancer cells hijack DNA methylation. And so that might give the impression that DNA methylation is bad. But in fact, it's really good. It's an important part of your cells. So this is one experiment that demonstrates this. Um, and it was done by the director of our institute now, Peter Jones. And so he took some cells, these are fibroblasts, and he treated them with a drug called 5-azacytidine, which essentially removes DNA methylation from most of the genome. And what he saw was that these cells started to change identity. He saw some of these round, white-filled cells. These were adipose-like cells. And then he saw some long, striated cells with multiple nuclei that were even contracting in the dish, and these are muscle cells. And so this is just a demonstration of how important DNA methylation and epigenetics is for maintaining proper expression so that the cell knows what type of cell it's supposed to be. Um, and removing DNA methylation causes them to get confused about their identity, or can cause them to get confused. OK, so to summarize part one, uh, we talked about how epigenetics controls gene expression without changing the DNA sequence. So no change to the A, T, C, and G, just chemical tags that are added to either DNA or the histones. And that changes the accessibility of the DNA, whether it can be read or not. And specifically, we talked about DNA methylation as being one of those important epigenetic modifications. That is the addition of CH3 to cytosine. And this mediates gene silencing, so the DNA is less accessible. It forms more of this heterochromatin state. And we know that epigenetics is necessary and very important for maintaining healthy cells. Are there any questions so far? You're welcome to raise your hand at any point, and I'll save time at the end. But if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them at the moment. OK, we'll keep going. OK, so now we're going to talk about cancer and how genetics and epigenetics are involved in this disease. So I want to start very simple. What is cancer? So we talk about cancer as being something that affects our grandparents, causes people to lose their hair. But what really is it at a scientific, biological uh, level? So the simplest definition is to say cancer is a disease of uncontrolled cell growth or cell division. And so a normal cell will have limits on how much it grows. It will know when to stop. And it will also know if it becomes damaged. If it gets genetic mutations, then it will undergo cell death, apoptosis, um, so that it doesn't <laughs> perpetuate the damage. But a cancer cell is one that has acquired so much damage that it doesn't know when to stop anymore. So it just keeps dividing and dividing and dividing. Um, and that's where you get a tumor forming, just a massive growth of cells, population of cells. So why do cancer cells divide uncontrollably? It comes back to the DNA, the A, T, C, and G code. If you interfere with that code, you're interfering with the gene, the products of these genes. And so that changes what proteins are made, and that changes the cell's ability to divide or not divide, and its choice to do that. How do genetic mutations cause cancer? Here I'm going to use the analogy of a car. Um, so cells, like cars, they have brakes and gas pedals on cell division. And these are called tumor suppressor genes, are like the brakes on cell growth. And oncogenes, um, when they're activated, that's like a gas pedal being stuck in full throttle. So you can imagine if you have a cell where you've got a mutated tumor suppressor gene, that's like knocking out the brakes. And if you've got a mutated oncogene, that's like stepping on the gas pedal. If you combine those two, you've got a problem. So that's what happens in cancer, is essentially the brakes and gas pedals, a number of them, get inactivated. So I want to talk through one example of this um, and look at some of the specific genes involved. This is 
the progression of colorectal cancer, which is the disease that I study. So one um, loss of a break, so a tumor suppressor gene, APC, is enough to cause the normal epithelium of the intestine to transform a little bit into what we call an early adenoma. In mice, loss of APC is sufficient to start um, up for a tumor to form, but in humans, it takes a little bit more. Um, they have more checks and balances, I guess you'd say. So the first hit is this break, APC. Then add in a mutation in a gas pedal called KRAS, and that leads to an intermediate adenoma. And then two more main hits. These are frequently seen in almost all colorectal cancers. Loss of SMAD4 is another break, and loss of P53 is another break, and you end up with cancer. So knocking out the breaks and stepping on the gas pedals, the oncogenes, uh, leads to cancer. So my boss asked this question a number of years ago. Does DNA methylation contribute to cancer? And prior to this experiment, we really didn't know. We thought that genetics was the only thing that was driving cancer, these mutations in the ATC and G code. Um, so he asked this question, which was really revolutionary at the time. So we're going to look at this modification here, DNA methylation again. Before I talk about this experiment, I just want to introduce uh, the topic of tools that we use to study cancer. So some of our questions can be answered just in test tubes um, using no, nothing living, just proteins or liquids or whatever. Um, but some of our questions, they require living things. Uh, so we can go up to cancer cells, which are basically cells that have been taken from a human or a mouse that had a tumor. And the one good thing about cancer cells growing uncontrollably is that they don't care whether they're in a person or on a piece of plastic, they'll just keep growing. So we can culture the cells and do experiments on those. But sometimes if you're talking about like tumors or the immune system, things that are more complicated than just cells on a piece of plastic, you need an organism to be able to test this. And so mice um, are a common model that we use. And so there will be an, a couple of experiments where I talk about where we use mice, including this next one. OK, so my boss wanted to ask the question, what is the role of DNA methylation in intestinal cancer? And so he chose to use a mouse model of intestinal cancer called the APC-MIN mice. These mice are genetically predisposed to getting intestinal tumors because they have a mutation in one copy of the APC gene, which you'll remember was the first step towards transformation in human disease and is enough to cause a tumor in mice. Um, so what the protein looks like is these mice have one truncated or short copy of the gene, and this doesn't work. Um, and this, they have one good copy, the plus, but when loss of heterozygosity occurs and this copy is used to replace this one for whatever reason, that's just random, it happens, then those mice develop tumors. So these mice can develop on their own anywhere from 10 to over 100 tumors in their intestine over their lifetime. So he asked the question, if I reduce DNA methylation in the mice that are genetically predisposed to getting tumors, will there be fewer tumors or more tumors or no difference? And so then he counted intestinal polyps in each of these mice. And what he found was really quite amazing. As he reduced the level of DNA methylation in the mice, he saw the number of intestinal polyps decreased in the mice as well. So normal DNA methylation, the average mice, mouse had 113 tumors in their intestine. But at the lowest level of DNA methylation, the mice only had an average of two tumors, which is quite amazing. Um, and it showed that epigenetics is really important for cancer cells, too, and has launched you know, a whole new field of study. And he's been, well, he wasn't the initiator of the field, but he's been a, a key player in that. All right, so to summarize part two, We've talked about how cancer is a disease of uncontrolled cell division caused by genetic mutations that inactivate tumor suppressor genes and activate oncogenes. But in addition to genetic mutations, we've learned that epigenetics is really important uh, to a cancer cell. We specifically looked at DNA methylation. 
Okay, so part three, the fun part, research. So what do we know about DNA methylation in cancer? A lot of our knowledge now comes from large projects like this one, TCGA, which stands for the Cancer Genome Atlas. This was a multi-million dollar project funded by taxpayers' dollars through the National Institutes of Health. Um, and basically, this project wanted to profile, create an atlas of what are the genetic and epigenetic mutations in tumors versus adjacent normal tissue from that patient. So they collected tumors from many different organs, hundreds of patients. They collected both the tumor and then the normal tissue to know what normal would look like for that person. And then made all this information publicly available online. So it's been a huge benefit to the community, the scientific community. And from that information, we've been able to look at the epigenome of many tumors. And what we found is that many genes become DNA hypermethylated in cancer. Hyper meaning too much. So there's too much methylation. So this figure is called a heat map, and it can be, look a little daunting, but I'll walk you through it. So DNA methylation, the level of DNA methylation is represented on this color scale here. Zero, the blue, means no methylation at that gene, and red means full methylation at that gene. And then we're looking at 995 genes. Each is a different row. They kind of all run together. You can't s distinguish individual ones, but trust me that there's 995 rows. And then there are 369 human colorectal cancer tumors represented, each as a column, as well as some adjacent normals. And what I want you to appreciate from this figure is that the adjacent normal tissue for these genes is very, it's very lowly methylated. So that blue color means it's free of methylation. Um, but across hundreds of tumors, you see an increase in methylation represented by the yellow to red color. Um, so this, just, this figure just demonstrates what I said, that in cancer, there's a lot of hypermethylation of DNA. We're still trying to figure out which of these genes are important and why this methylation occurs. But we have some clues. Um, so we know, we covered this in part one, that DNA hypermethylation mediates silencing of genes. So we also talked about tumor suppressor genes and how those tend to get inactivated. And indeed, we found that some of these tumor suppressor genes, APC and P53, for example, get methylated in some patients' tumors. And so that leads to silencing of the breaks. And we know what happens then. That's a problem. So, um, but there are many, there are hundreds of genes that we don't really know why they're methylated or what, what that's doing. And so researchers are still working on that. Okay. So when I joined the lab, there were a lot of directions I could go. But one of the questions that I asked myself is, how does this DNA hypermethylation arise in cancer cells? Is it just completely random, like someone's unlucky and it just they just get all this methylation? Or are there, is there something that's non-random? Is there something in a person's environment that's inducing methylation? And so I looked at uh, risk factors, known risk factors for colorectal cancer. Um, these include being old, over 50, lack of physical exercise, so obesity, um, personal history of inflammatory bowel diseases, use of alcohol and tobacco, low fiber diet, that sort of thing. And what I noticed is that there was something that several of these had in common, and that is inflammation. So it may not be super apparent, but aging and obesity and use of alcohol, as well as the inflammatory disease, those are all associated with some level of inflammation in the people often. And so I decided to ask the question, does inflammation induce DNA hypermethylation? So I needed to be able to model inflammation, that's a very complex uh, biological phenomenon, and so it's not something I could do on a petri dish. So I did this in a mouse, and if you treat mice with a compound called DSS, dextran sulfate sodium, that leads to inflammation in their colons. It causes some damage in the, colon, the colonic epithelium and allows some bacteria to infiltrate into places where it shouldn't, and that leads to inflammation. So now we're zooming in on the colon of this is a normal mouse. 
Um, so what I want you to appreciate from this is how organized it looks. There's these repeating units of these um, kind of like fingers. These are called crypts. There's a whole bunch of them in a row. Um, so very organized all along lining up on the basement membrane. And there's also lots of white cells in them. Those are called goblet cells. They're producing mucins. And those are good, healthy for the colon. So when I treated mice with DSS, what I saw was patches like this. Um, we call this dysplasia. It's not normal looking tissue. It no longer is super organized. Um, these cells are all just kind of going whichever way they want. They're not lined up along a basement membrane. They have all these immune cells are infiltrating around here. And we've lost all these white cells, the goblet cells. So these are very stem-like and highly proliferative cells. And just so you can compare it to something um, that you know is bad, this is a tumor, also disorganized, also doesn't have many of those white cells. So they look very similar. So I was excited. I didn't know it was going to look like this, this bad um, when I was doing this experiment. But I was excited that maybe there are epigenetic changes in these cells, DNA methylation, that could predispose to tumors. And so what we did was um, went down the hill to Michigan State's new research building. They have a fancy microscope called a laser capture microdissection scope. And it allows you to put slides of tissue under this microscope like this, and then draw a circle on the computer screen around the section you are interested in. And then it will shine a laser and cut out that region of tissue and drop it into your tube. So it's quite amazing. So I cut out some normal tissue, and I cut out some of this dysplasia. And then I cut out some what I called recovered tissue, so tissue that looked a little more normal but was sitting right next to the dysplasia. So it probably was inflamed at some point, but then went back to being somewhat normal. And then we did whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So that's how we profile the methylation of these cells. And what I found was that the inflamed and the recovered colon tissue does actually have more methylation. After This was after three to four weeks of inflammation in the mice. The colonic cells had about 2.5% more methylation than the normal colon. And you may say, oh, 2.5%, like that's very small. But this is such a short, this is a very short time period. Can you imagine like a 50-year-old person who has had inflammation, maybe if they have an inflammatory bowel disease, that's a lot of inflammation, or it could just be um, about with the stomach flu here and there, inflammation. It's hard, it's hard to say. Um, but it does seem that perhaps inflammation has a role in induction of DNA hypermethylation. And so future directions on this uh, project that are ongoing. One of those is how does repeated or long-term inflammation impact DNA methylation over an organism's lifetime? And could preventing or reversing this inflammation-induced DNA hypermethylation reduce the risk of colon cancer? So those are both interesting questions. I don't know if I'll have a chance to finish answering these, but um, hopefully someone will. OK, the second short story I want to tell you about is about gut bacteria. So you heard in the introduction that I studied bacteria before uh, grad school. So this is just really interesting to me. And I hope you'll find it interesting, too. So do gut bacteria alter DNA methylation in human cells? So I put this fun fact here. You're about 50% human. Half of your cells are actually bacterial cells. Um, in terms of cell number, you're 50% human. So a lot of them reside in the colon. Um, and they are very good for you. Bacteria get a bad rap that they're bad, but they're very good. You would be sad if you didn't have these. But they produce a whole lot of um, metabolites and things that can communicate and be uptaken by our human cells. And so a group asked this question, which I think is a great question. Do gut bacteria alter DNA methylation in human cells? So they took some human intestinal cells and cultured them on a Petri dish. And with, for some of them, they added in bacteria, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. You might recognize these. These are common um, genus or genera used in yogurt making. So check the side of your yogurt cup, and you'll probably see lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. 
And so then they compared the methylation of those cells treated with bacteria versus those that were not. And what they found was that after 24 expo hour exposure to this bacteria, there were 92 genes that had differential DNA methylation. So the control, um, so this is also a heat map, just different colors than before. The blue is now representing methylation. So the lactobacillus, lactobacillus and bifidobacterium group, there's a cluster here that gained methylation, the blue, compared to the green of the control group, and there's some going the other way too. So um, it goes in both directions. So it does seem possible that the microbes in you could be changing your epigenome, which is kind of weird to think about. But I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. Um, a lot of bacteria are good for you, so maybe this is good change. Um, it's hard to say. But what we do know is that in patients with colorectal cancer, their microbiome communities look quite a, bit, quite a bit different in their colons than do normal patients. So here I'm showing patients that have tumors versus patients that are healthy. And you can see there's an enrichment of this pink Firmicutes bacteria in the tumor-bearing patients and uh, more of the proteobacteria in the healthy patients. So there are differences between the two populations of people. And so some future questions are, does the microbiome actually impact disease risk? And if so, does it accomplish this by epigenetic modification of the host? So just some interesting questions to think about. OK, so to summarize part three, I've showed that colorectal cancer cells have many DNA hypermethylated genes, and this can include tumor suppressor genes such as APC and P53. And today I just talked about uh, colorectal cancer, but this is actually true of every cancer type, breast cancer, lung cancer. There's DNA hypermethylation of many genes. And researchers are investigating how DNA hypermethylation arises in the cells possibly inflammation, possibly microbes, but there's many more avenues to explore for sure. Okay, so some takeaways to summarize the three parts. Epigenetics is control of gene expression by altering DNA accessibility, not DNA sequence. And we learned how DNA methylation mediates gene silencing, and that's critical. That's a very important part of maintaining your cell's identity and function. Then we talked about cancer, how it's a disease of uncontrolled cell division that's caused by genetic mutations that inactivate the brakes or step on the gas pedal. And uh, despite these genetic mutations, it does appear that epigenetics still has a role in genetically driven cancers, um, looking at DNA methylation specifically. And then the last part, the epigenome can respond to the environment in ways that could potentially impact disease risk. There's a lot we don't know yet, um, but perhaps inflammation and microbes or other factors that have yet to be explored uh, are partly responsible for this DNA hypermethylation that we see in cancer cells. Okay, so before I conclude and take time for questions, I just want to briefly touch on epigenetics for cancer therapy, question mark. Um, so obviously, the whole point of cancer research is to eventually come up with a better cure or treatment for disease. And sometimes when we're in the lab doing experiments with mice, it feels very far removed from anything that is practical. But I want to just point out this experiment again, uh, done in mice, but that's the, the step before we get to humans, pretty much. Um, even in these uh, mice that had a genetic disease, Epigenetic therapy, essentially, was able to reduce their tumor number. So I think that epigenetics is very hopeful for future cancer therapy. And in fact, the drug 5-azacytidine that I talked about mentally that, um, earlier that depletes DNA methylation from the genome, that has already been approved for use in uh, one cancer type and is being tested in many other cancer types. And it's very effective in the lab. It's tricky in people because the drug doesn't always get effectively delivered to the tumor cells, especially the solid tumors. It's good in blood tumors more because that you can uh, get the drug more easily. But that's certainly an area of open investigation. The problem with that drug 
um, is that it's not specific at all. So you saw how that changed the fibroblasts into some other cell types. It could be doing that in the people too, to be honest. Um, so we need to figure out which epigenetic events are critical for the tumors, and then how do we specifically reverse those or readjust the dimmer switch on those particular genes? And those are questions we don't have answers to yet, and we don't have drugs that can specifically target one gene that has a messed up epigenome. So um, those are future challenges, but also exciting directions for the field. Okay, and with that, I will acknowledge my lab, several of whom are here today, so that's awesome they came to support me, um, but it's great to work with such an awesome team. Also, the core facilities that help make experiments possible without going crazy is great. So the pathology images and the people who help with the mice are great. Also, John Beck at Michigan State for using the microscope. And then my funding comes from the graduate school and this F31 grant, so I'll acknowledge all of those. And then we have plenty of time for questions for those of you who would like to ask them. Yes? Yeah, we have a, yeah, we're, 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 you're gonna you're gonna be on YouTube, so we need this. I have a question about the methylation of your mice and how you got the methylation. You had a slide yes. that talked about um, it a little bit, and you mentioned it at the bottom. I think it said something about the food that you're feeding it. I'm just yes. wondering what that is, and if you can go back so I can write more stuff down. Yes, for sure. We'll get there. There we go. Okay, so there are a variety of ways that we can use in the lab to reduce DNA methylation. One of them in this experiment was that drug, 5-Azacytidine. Um, but other approaches, we have some genetic tricks that we can do to control the enzymes that add DNA methylation. They're called DNA methyltransferases, or DNMTs for short. So we can control the expression of those enzymes that add methylation and therefore alter the level of methylation in the cells. And then diet, um, so folate deficient diets are often used to reduce DNA methylation, but there are probably other ones too that people could use. Mm -hmm. I might ask a question since I, <laughs> um, so um, I've uh, seen in a video and kind of read um, a part of, about a study before about um, sometimes the, uh, the epigenetic changes, you know, if they happen maybe at a certain point in the animal's life, can affect mm -hmm. the germline cells and then be passed on to offspring like the agouti gene in mice. Yeah. And, and then I saw a study a while back, I think about maybe it was diabetes and um, in, in times of famine. And, and so is there anything known about uh, any of those types of changes affecting um, these cancer genes and being passed on to children or future generations? That's a great question. I don't think we know enough to be able to answer that yet, but certainly um, epigenetics is heritable, so it can be passed from parent to child, and there are a lot of studies looking at that, particularly in like metabolic disorders, like you mentioned. Um, but in terms of cancer risk, I haven't seen many studies on that, um, but that's a great direction, that, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So many questions come from <laughs> Right? <laughs> More questions than answers. Uh, so when, when we talk about inflammation, right, have you looked at which cytokines are involved in that inflammation and how that correlates to methylation? Right. So you're right that inflammation is very complex. There's lots of cytokine cascades that are going on. Some people have tried, and I've even tried to basically reduce inflammation into a cell culture model system so I can put in like interleukin-6 onto the cells and see if that causes methylation and then try some other ones. I didn't see a big change in methylation. Some people report that IL-6 is one that can alter the stability of the enzyme DNMT um, that can impact methylation. So people are looking at that. But I, I, again, I don't think that we have a good answer for that. And may I ask, uh, 
ask another one? Of course. So, and then I have another question as far as chromosomes go, right? When we talk about chromosomes, we also have to talk about telomeres and telomeres. Mm -hmm. Is the, are you working with any connections there and looking at how cells are ex essentially, <laughs> essentially duplicating and how that is all affected with it? Thank you. Yeah, I have not looked at that, but actually we have a resident expert <laughs> who's... <laughs> so there's another grad student in our lab, Jamie, who's sitting here. She's studying aging and DNA methylation. So she's just in her second year, so hasn't really gotten into the project too much yet, but maybe in a few years she can come give a talk and talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Sorry, I'm gonna ask one more. Um, so uh, the uh, the slide on the differences in the gut biome and people with and without tumors. Yeah. I mean, are, are they to the point where they could even dare like make a suggestion on probiotics or foods or anything like that that might affect your gut biome with respect to that? I don't think we're to that point okay. yet. Um, Just off the record then, your advice? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So uh, there are certain bacterial um, genuses that are genera that have been associated with more aggressive tumors. Fusobacterium is one of them, so stick away from fusobacterium, but that's not in your yogurt, so you'll be okay. Um, I don't know about, um, I think that the lactobacillus and the bifidobacterium, I think that's good. Um, I think it can reduce inflammation in the gut, and that seems to be good for reducing methylation, at least, maybe. Um, so I don't, think, I don't think we know enough. It's more correlative studies saying these patients have this, healthy patients have this, what does that mean? But what we're trying, a lot of people are trying to address this in mice, which is tricky because mice don't always colonize with human bacteria. So if we want to study human, but can't get the human bacterium to grow in the mouse, then that's a problem and limits our studies there. Um, but people are colonizing mice, basically making the mice completely free of bacteria, they call them germ-free, and then giving them like one bacterial strain at a time, plus like a cancer model, and saying, oh, this bacterium reduces cancer number, tumor number, or it increases or it makes no difference. So we're trying to simplify it and address those kind of questions, but it's very complex, um, and so we don't have a good answer. Yeah. Hey, is this working? Hello. Uh, yeah, it's a quick question. Um, yeah. So is it uh, pretty well um, understood and agreed upon that uh, methylation kind of leads to cancer, or would it be that cancer leads to methylation? Uh, is there... You know, is that look, uh, looked at? That is a great question. So I'm trying to test that in the lab. Um, our lab's theory or like working hypothesis is that a background state of DNA hypermethylation could predispose you to getting cancer if you get a genetic mutation as well. Like it could synergize with the genetic mutation and enable that tumor to then grow out. Um, so basically we're saying, at least in the mice, the APC might not be sufficient to cause a tumor to form. It probably needs some other things too, like epigenetic changes. So we're trying to sort that out with some cool mouse models that I didn't have time to tell you about today. Um, but we don't actually know. It could be, and I think part of it does come after the tumor is formed. So just randomly or to help the tumor grow, it will hijack DNA methylation and use it for its own benefit. So I think it's probably both, um, but we don't know for sure. Yeah. If there's one more question. So, so going back to the diet question, right? There's yeah. some fascinating studies in, I'm, I'm not pronouncing that right, but in Hasta Hunter Gatherers in Africa, mm and how their microbiome looks like and differentiates between rain season and dry season mm -hmm. and how that actually correlates to a Western population. Mm -hmm. And there's some uh, fantastic findings on how that is quite different from Westerners who tend to suffer from uh, inflammatory bowel disease and things like that. So, yeah. so, so I, I thought that might be, you know, speaking to does diet affect to some degree methylation or not, and it very might, might, 
might well be because those hunter gatherers generally live uh, healthy yeah, and for suffer sure. less chronic disease. Yeah, I'm, there's no doubt that different diets influence your disease risk and also your microbiome population. I think you could probably f um, figure out where a person was from by profiling their microbiome based on what they eat in that region kind of thing. Um, and so yeah, I think that diet is very important for both disease risk and uh, your microbiome. Mm -hmm. So any more questions? I'm gonna respect everybody's time here. Nope. All right, well, let's give Nicole a round of applause. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Have a nice night.